Yeah, so I'm James Hills. I come from Tassie. I actually grew up in Sydney, did my studies in Armidale. My mother grew up in Dorigo. My family are all based in uh, northern New South Wales and southern Queensland. But I moved to Tassie. I've been there for 20 years, so I'm the odd one out. Um, but I do know this region quite well. Um, my mum came off a dairy farm in Dorigo, a very small one back in those days. Um, but um, I've had those links to dairying. I think as a kid, when I was growing up, I went up to Walk Ivory quite often on a dairy farm up there, and I used to milk cows. We started off in, a, in some stalls where I used to sit on a stool and you know, put on, on the individual stalls, and obviously we went from there. So I've had a fair bit to do with dairying over the years. Um, so I'm the, what, what I call the, the centre leader for um, the livestock production centre uh, at the University of Tasmania, um, which deals with dairy and, and red meat. So we have a team of people working across those two, two industries. So um, that's, that's where I, I sit at the moment. I've done a lot of work over the last um, six to seven years in irrigation, um, which is one of the reasons I'm here today as part of the Smart Irrigation Project, just to give you a bit of an update on, on the things that we've learnt um, as we've uh, looked at, at irrigation um, on farm and also in a research context. So today I just want to go through some of the main lessons we've learnt through what we've been able to, I suppose, observe um, in terms of irrigation use on pastures, particularly in Tasmania, and, uh, and then some of the specific research that we're doing to help to back up some of the things that we're learning and to, to help us to further develop um, irrigation systems around technology and so forth. So we'll see how we go. I like to be fairly interactive and I know that doesn't work so well with videoing, but um, if, if I'm talking about something and you don't understand, just stop me. Yesterday I was talking and I said something that uh, was actually wrong. I meant to say something else and I was picked up on it. There were quite a few people confused when I said it, so I'm glad somebody picked me up on it. Um, so please, if you don't understand something, ask me. Uh, if you've got some comments to add, I'm very happy to be able to, to discuss with you. Where I want to start is with an example of some observations we made on uh, a dairy farm down in Tasmania back in 2015. When we started this smart irrigation work right back then, back in 2015, one of the objectives was just to go out into industry, to look at farms, to collect data off farms and just to see what was happening. So we've got quite a lot of uh, really good pasture-based dairy farm farms in Tasmania and farmers in Tasmania um, who do quite a good, good job. Um, but when we went out there in 2015, we didn't really want to interact with the farmers. We just wanted to go out there, stick a whole heap of sensors out there and just see what was happening. We didn't want to influence the behaviour. So we said to the farmer, right, we're going to come on your farm, we're going to stick a whole heap of stuff out there and we're going to see how you're going. So we did that over the first year of this project and then in the second and third year we started to interact with the farmer and get them to make changes. So this particular farm where we, where we started doing this work is in a place called Cressy in Tasmania. So I don't know whether people know so much about Tasmania but it's down in the central part of Tasmania below Launceston. Um, probably about 600 millimetres of rainfall, pretty well all over winter, very little rainfall over summer where we grow most of our pasture, so we need to have irrigation. You just won't have a dairy down there without irrigation. And so during January, February um, and into March, you basically have to irrigate pretty well full time to be able to grow your pastures. So they rely on irrigation. This particular site was a 117 hectare pivot, all pasture. It is an area that has a number of different soil types on it, so it was a very interesting um, site to actually monitor. Now, when we... When we looked at the pasture growth rate under that pivot in that first year, what we found is that that farmer, though he considered himself to be a really good farmer, and as you saw from that picture that was nice and green, thought he was doing a great job, when we actually measured it, we were getting about 30 to 40 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day. Now that's pretty poor. Why would that be? In fact, he used 6.2 megs per hectare of irrigation. So he was piling the water on, during that period of time, but he was only getting what I would consider to be pretty poor pasture growth rates. When we worked with that farmer over a number of years, when we got to 16, uh, year 17, 18, we managed to achieve an average of about um, 68 um, kilos of dry matter per hectare throughout the season. Early on in the season, we were probably getting you know, between 80 and 120 kilos of dry matter. Here in January, where there was no rainfall and you know, every time you make a, 
uh, a mistake in your irrigation, it certainly shows up. We dropped a little bit, down about 60, but it was 60 to 70 kilos. Increased here in autumn when the rains came back in, and then we had um, uh, army worms come in and decimate the pasture right at the end there. Um, but essentially we did a lot better in our pasture growth rates on average through that season with less water. Now that farmer, over those three years, um, he increased his herd size by 100 cows without doing anything else because he was growing so much more grass. Okay, so it's a pretty simple um, story. No, no extra cost really in terms of input, but an ability to be able to feed a whole, whole heap more cows on that system. So what was going on? What was the, the reason that we managed to um, make these changes? Well, think about that. But first of all, just putting that data up there. So the average growth rate, about 34 kilos of dramatic per day per day across the season in 15-16, about uh, 70 in 17-18. Uh, in if we look at the total tonnes of pasture grown, only 6.2 here, 12.4 tonnes. This is just over the irrigation season. It's not the full year. This is just over the period that we measured. Um, the amount of irrigation. So this year here, we had about 215 mils of rain, very similar in 17 and 18. They're very similar years, 15, 16, 17 and 18. Um, but we used a lot less water. So our gross production water use index, the number of tonnes of dry matter per megalitre of rainfall and irrigation was only 0.74 in this year and it was 1.65 in that year. So we doubled our production over those, those years. So when the farmer was looking at these figures, he just said, okay, we had an opportunity to loss about 35 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day, about 368 tonnes of pasture over that three months, um, just for that one pivot. He had to buy a whole heap more feed in in this year than in this year. Um, so he just did a quick back of the envelope calculation. So that's about $70,000 worth. So really quickly for him, he's seeing the value of being able to get his irrigation right um, just as a result of making some changes between this year and this year. Okay, just before we go on to talk about the main way that this was achieved, which is all about scheduling, um, just remember that there are a whole heap of reasons that pasture growth rate might be limited. It could be due to the climate. Uh, if it's too hot and ryegrass can't grow, well, it doesn't matter how much water you throw at it, it's not going to grow. Okay, so there's another issue that's going to inhibit it. Soil fertility, now your nitrogen obviously has a big impact on it. Grazing management, when we first made those changes between the first and the second year, he, he had an issue where he didn't have enough stock to graze. He ended up getting behind with his grazing management, everything went to head and he had a real problem then and so that, that affected growth rates because everything was maturing and he had to go on top of a whole heap of stuff because he just didn't, wasn't able to manage all that extra. Pasture. So grazing management can have an impact. But in, in reality, the biggest issue he had down here and the lessons that we learnt was all around this issue of irrigation scheduling, getting irrigation scheduling right. So what I want to do is I want to spend a little bit of time just thinking about the important points around irrigation scheduling. We've already had some of them mentioned. Um, but let's think about the three things that I believe are really, really important things to know. First of all, we need to know the readily available water for our soil. Okay, so how much is in our bucket that is able to be used by that pasture to grow the grass? We need to, need to understand that. We need to understand how much is going out. So we've been talking a lot about that. So in Tassie, you know, up to seven millimetres a day. Up here, you probably know, at the peak, it's more like 10 or 12 millimetres per day uh, that we lose. We need to understand that. And we also need to, as we've been talking about, understand our system capacity. What we are capable of putting back into the system to refill it, okay? So all those three things are really important in terms of irrigation scheduling. So if we think about those three things, uh, here's our bucket of readily available water in the soil. We need to know how much is there, we need to know how much we can put in, and we need to know how much is being used. And I often think about this whole concept of readily available water in relation to a sponge. So let's just move on to readily available water. So when we think of our soils, we're pretty familiar with the fact that we can go from saturated all the way through to bone dry. What we want to do when we're growing pasture is make sure, as Peter's been talking about, that we keep the soil moisture within this zone between what we call field capacity and our refill point. So plants can still grow between our refill point and our wielding point, but they have to use a lot more energy to draw that water out, and so their growth rate is going to drop. So we need to make sure that our soil moisture is kept within this zone. So if you take a, 
a sponge and you stick it under a tap and you fill it up with moisture and then you pull it out quickly, what will happen to it? You just get water pouring out the bottom of it, won't you? And it'll drain out to the point where it stops draining but there's heaps of water still in there. That's what we would define as fuel capacity. So when it's too wet, you're not going to grow too well, but when it's got to the point where that excess water is drained out, so that you've got some more ability for oxygen there as well, you're at that, that field capacity. We don't want to be any wetter than that. We then want to be able to you know, take that sponge and just slightly squeeze it and lots of water will come out. Not a lot of energy required, is there? No, that's what the plants want to use. No, water that they can extract real easy. But you'll get to the point where there's still a lot of water in there, but you've got to work really hard to get that water out. Well, that's exactly what it is with regard to the plants once you get below this point. We want to make sure that we're keeping the water in that zone where the plants can easily use it. Okay, so that's readily available water. What is it? How do we define it? How can we learn what our soils can hold? Um, well, it's a property of the soil texture, it's a property of the bulk density, of the compaction, there's a whole heap of things that affect um, the, the soil moisture, the type of, of soil that's there, whether it's sand, clay, um, and so forth. So no, you need to be able to understand your soils, understand the type of soils that are there, and then from that work out how much readily available water is there. So for a lot of, a lot of soils, and this is some examples of some soils in, in Tassie, um, no, there may be the department has done some, some analysis and, and taken some cores and done a water retention curve and worked it out, um, but essentially uh, for, for something like a sand, the amount of readily available water in millimetres per metre of depth, that's how it's normally expressed, there's about 30 millimetres. Whereas you go to a loam, there's about 90 millimetres. Why would that be? Why would there be a lot less water available in a sand than in a loam? Can anyone tell me? Potentially? Sorry? Yeah, so it all no, it just can't hold it, it all drains out. So there's not as much left there once you reach that, that field capacity point. Um, so without that much there, well, if your plants are growing in that, they're going to use that water and there's not as much there, they'll use it up fairly quickly, won't they? So there's less there. Um, and then alone. what about a clay? Why is there less, in, less available in a clay compared with a loam? Yeah, the clay keeps it, that's right. So there's a fair bit there. If you looked at the total amount of water in a clay, there's a fair bit there, but the ability for the plants to draw it out, that readily available, is a lot harder because they're going to have to work pretty hard because it's, it's adhering to the clay um, and so it's, it's not available. So. Uh, depending on your soil type, it'll have an impact on the amount of readily available water. The other thing you need to think about is obviously the rooting depth of your pasture or the crop that you have to be able to calculate the amount of readily available water that is within that root zone. So typically pastures here, what would you see as a, a typical depth of pastures on this farm? Um, yeah, so we, on our alluvial country we'll, we'll be, you know, a metre potentially or something like that, but on up here, it, it'd be less on top of these hills. Yep. Sort of thing. Okay, so the experience we've had uh, varies. Yeah, you can certainly go down to a metre um, it, with, with some of your roots, particularly on the types of soils um, that might be you know, loamy and easy to, to, to uh, move down. But typically when we go out there and look at pastures on a variety of soils, 95% of the roots that are effective for growth are in that top 30 centimetres. So we tend to work on a 30 centimetre depth for a lot of your pasture in terms of that effective zone for water use. So uh, if you had a loosened crop in, well it's over a metre yeah, for effective depth, so you were drawing water from a lot lower down. A maize crop as well would be a lot deeper. Um. So how do we calculate the amount of readily available water in our rooting zone? Well simply we take our rooting depth um, in terms of metres and we multiply it by the amount of readily available water in millimetres per metre. And so in this particular example here, 80 uh, millimetres per metre times uh, 30 centimetres, 0.3 of a metre is 24 millimetres of readily available water. So for this example, uh, on a clay loam in a ferrosol soil, 25 mils is about what you would expect. Typically for most pasture systems, anywhere between about uh, 10 mils and about 25 mils is about what you would expect in terms of readily available water. Does that sound reasonable? That's about what you expect in terms of the size of your bucket. Okay, let's have a quick look at the example from that Cressy site. On that Cressy site, the 117 hectare pivot, we had three different soil types. We had one right up the top of the, the, the pivot. We had some of these wetter gullies, and then we had right down the bottom end of the pivot. If we looked at the, um, 
depth of the roots. The depth of the roots here were down to about 40 centimetres where you had the bulky roots. Here in this particular example, we had a very, very clear clay layer right here at 30 centimetres. The roots went to there and no further, so 30 centimetres of depth. Down here, we had a really hard ironstone and we had 15 centimetres down to there and the roots went there and no further. Okay, so big difference across that pivot. So what does that mean in terms of readily available water for that site? Well, we know that there was 19 millimetres in, in the 30 centimetre root zone because we, we did our, our samples there. So the amount of readily available water at the top of the pivot is 25 mils. The amount of readily available water at the bottom of the pivot is 9.5 mils. Now that soil type was about a third of the pivot. So what is the most limiting part of this system? Pretty simple, isn't it? It's this area here. Okay, so if we were wanting to irrigate to keep the readily available water bucket full, then we need to use 9.5 millimetres as our readily available water. Now if, you've, if you're losing, uh, say, 6 mils a day, how many days before your bucket's empty? Yeah, one and a half, less than two days. Now, if you're needing to irrigate to keep that bucket full, you're needing to irrigate every two days on that site. Now, that doesn't matter about this up here because, no, it'll, it'll continue to grow fine because you're keeping topping it up. But essentially, on this particular site, if you're not coming back to that spot within two days, no, or up here within one day, then you're going to start to stress that crop. So understanding readily available water is really key to understanding what your scheduling needs to be. Does that make sense? So, so there's two things going on there. One is the total amount that you apply to, at a time. The other is the time at which you've got to get back to it. So the big issue with changing the speed is can you get back there within a day or within a day and a half or two days to, to top that up again? Okay, so no, there'll, there, there'll be a number of solutions to this and one of those is changing the speed Another is having variable rate irrigation available, but the key is it to it is is water to your limitation. So you can water the whole lot to this limitation. So you might only put on nine and a half mils in a in a sweep if you've got a, a pivot, or even seven or eight mils in a sweep, and, and just keep coming back and keep topping it up. Okay, um, if you put on more, well you'll you'll start to waste it. So it's just readily available water is a really important concept to understand. Um, obviously the amount of water used is evapotranspiration, um, so we know how much is going out of the system. Um, I won't worry too much about the theory around that. Um, a grass crop, ET naught's pretty good at approximates the amount of water um, that we get. So the evapotranspiration from your weather station is, is pretty good. Here's an example of evapotranspiration data in Tassie. Uh, over winter, by the middle of summer we're getting six to seven. So obviously it's a fair bit less than up here. Um, which means that the capacity of our systems don't have to be as high in Tassie as what they have to be up here. Okay, so just, just a point to understand. Okay, let's, let's move on to system capacity because we've been thinking a little bit about that. So the system capacity is the maximum possible rate at which a machine can apply water to an irrigated field area and expressed in millimetres per day, not the depth applied per pass. And this is where a lot of people get this wrong. So a farmer might say, oh yeah, I put 12 mils on. My, my, my system is capable of 12 mils. But that 12 mils might be done in two days, so in 48 hours. So the system capacity for that particular system is going to be six mils. Okay, so system capacity is how much you can put on in your design system in 24 hours. Because you need to compare that with the evapotranspiration rate, how much is, is disappearing. So we were talking about these pivots here, the system capacity of these pivots were around 11, 12 millimetres. A lot of the system capacities for pivots in Tassie are around six to seven millimetres. Okay, and there's a reason behind that um, because of the, the differences in, in evapotranspiration. If you're thinking about a, a hard hose, how do we work out the system capacity for a hard hose? Well, a hard hose typically might put on 25 to 30 mils at a time when you, when you put it on. Okay, so if you've got that um, particular run that you're running it and you put your 30 mils on here on one day and then the next day you move it to this point and then the next day you move to the next point and the next point. So if you've got six runs, okay, and it's going to be seven days before you get back to here, okay, if you can put 30 mils on over, say, six days, just to make it easy, then what is the capacity of that, the system capacity for that system? 30 mils 
divided by five days, or six days, sorry, there's going to be five millimetres. The system capacity for that is five millimetres. Now, is that enough? No. So, if you want to be able to keep up with no, 10 millimetres disappearing every day, you're going to have to not do six days between runs, but three or four days between runs. Okay? So, you change the total area that you're irrigating to increase your system capacity. Okay? So, if you have a pivot, it is designed from the time you put it in, and it'll always be the capacity that it's been designed and put in for. With um, a traveller, you've just got to determine how many runs you, you use it on to be able to, to adjust your system capacity. Okay? Does that make sense? And you want a system capacity that can keep up with maximum water use. We can chat a little bit more about system capacity and um, you know, what you think is suitable. One of the things we've really got to think about with system capacity is this. The greater the system capacity, and you've already said this but I want to emphasise it, the greater the system capacity, the greater the total head for that system and therefore the greater the cost every time you turn that system on. Okay? So what we find, say, in somewhere like Tassie is we would say most farmers will look at their total evapotranspiration, say seven mils, and it's only over a short period of time, right at the peak, and they say, right, that's our maximum. And that only occurs on certain days, so the average is usually a little bit less than that. So we, we would say that a lot of the farmers would say, well, I'm going to put in a system that might be one or two mils above that. So they'll put in a seven or an eight mil pack. The reason being that if they get behind, they want to be able to catch up again. Okay, so if the system case is too low, then it's going to be a problem. They'll get behind and we'll, we'll see why in a minute. That's a problem. But if they go too high, if you compare the cost of running two equivalent systems that have the same infrastructure leading into them, one is a six mil pack and one is an eight mil pack, and you look at the six mil pack running 24 hours a day versus the eight mil pack running off peak plus a little bit of on peak to make sure you can still water appropriately, okay, you'll always find that the six mil pack will come out ahead financially. And that's looking at off peak and peak. So the point being made is that if you go too high above what is required, every time you turn that thing on, it's costing you more money. But from a farmer's point of view, if they've got reasons that they have to stop, whether they're cutting silage or whether they're worried about breaking down and starting up, they will say, well, what is my risk profile? Because the cost of poor production in pasture is actually the biggest cost. And if you think that you're going to get behind and lose production, then put a little bit more capacity in your system and pay for that. Because that'll be less cost than the cost on production. Isn't so the cost per megalitre is the same run? That's the actual capital cost? No, no, there's two components. One is the cost of capital. So the cost of capital is greater as you get bigger because you've got bigger infrastructure and the cost, the energy cost of moving that water is greater every time you turn it on. Are they identical because no. you've got a bigger pump running the same efficiency? So per meg, it should be identical, right? No. It's, it's, yeah, because of what you pump more water. So per meg, it should be identical. It's not identical at all. No. So you've got more head and, and therefore the cost of moving that is greater because you have to have um, a greater flow to be able to achieve what you need to. Now, if you take your infrastructure and you increase the size of that infrastructure to compensate for that extra head through that process, then, yeah, so I, I was talking about a, a system, yeah, so that's why I'm saying it's not just a like for a like in terms of every system has to be assessed. Yes, there is, if you have put a heap more capital cost in at the front and you can bring those back down, then you can, no, um, get to the point where you've equalised that running cost. But generally speaking, where uh, where people put those systems in, they'll have a, a system of pipe work that comes from your pump, right, which is a certain size, right, and then they'll have a different capacity or different ability with your with your all your sprinkler heads. And so, what will happen is that the cost of running that system will be a lot higher than the, than the lower capacity system. Yeah, yep. More water through the same system. yeah, that's right. Yeah, but I take your point absolutely. If you've gone and put a whole heap of investment in up front and you've brought that head down, the total head down, then you should be able, well, yeah, depending on how you manage that, you can bring that cost down. 
absolutely. But it is a fair bit more capital, is what he's saying. To yeah. To and yeah, is that when you, I think when you do the numbers over the lifespan of the area, or even and quicker than that, because if you do it over five, six years, what is it? Yeah, we've done a lot of comparisons. Yeah, it does, because you can um, amortise it over time, so no problem with that. But yeah, we've certainly done a lot of comparisons with it, and I think we've just got to be careful with two things. One is that potential extra cost. The second is the potential to end up um, getting it wrong in terms of irrigation so that it affects your pasture growth rate. Okay, And that costs you a lot more than the energy cost. So our, our comment tend to be with people is, make sure you grow your pasture right, <laughs> Don't focus on just trying to chase off peak, because if you're going to try and chase off peak to save a little bit of money, and you get it wrong in terms of your pasture growth rate, it's going to cost you a heck of a lot more. Does that make sense? Yep. OK. Um, let's just put together the information that we've been learning then. Let's assume we've got a, a system where our bucket is 24 millimetres. So 24 millimetres of raw. We're losing 6.7 millimetres of evapotranspiration a day. The system capacity is 6.7 millimetres, so this is, this is our Cressy system down there in, 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 in uh, Tasmania. And then let's just say we're going to water every third day with this system. Okay? This is the farmer, he's thinking, great, I feel really good, every three days I'm going to go and do a circle and put some water on that system. Okay, I start with a full profile, and this is water deficit, this is how much it's drying out. This is our fill capacity, this is our refill point. Okay? I, I, I'm full. I wait two days and then on the third day I put in 6.7 mils. Okay? I use 6.7 mils as well. Right? So what happens is I flatline my soil moisture. I then wait for two days and then I turn the thing on and put another 6.7 mils in. What's happening within um, six days? I'm dropping below my refill point. Right? I wait for another two days. And then I panic because I start to see the grass is starting to go a little bit off green. And I turn that pivot on and I leave it running flat out every day. Great, I'm putting all this water into the system. I feel really good. Where's my soil moisture? It's well below my readily available water. Okay, because you're using what you're putting in every day and you're not filling up your profile. So it doesn't matter. And in Tassie, this is a real problem that we've seen, which we've labelled the green drought. The farmer can be watering flat out Okay, feeling really good about it. The pasture can look green, but its growth rate is pretty poor. And that's exactly what happened in that first year where we measured that 30 to 40 kilos of dry matter, even though 6.2 megs was used. He got into this situation. His, his system was about what would have been the maximum. We had a really hot and dry January. He watered flat out that whole time after he'd allowed it to dry down and he couldn't catch up. Okay, so that's the really important lesson around making sure your system capacity is big enough to be able to catch up, okay? So that you want to make sure your design is right to be able to catch up. But too much, potentially, if you haven't put the capital investment in, can end up costing you a fair bit. Right, let's actually have a look at some data off that site, just to help us to really understand this. So this is uh, in 2016, down there on that Cressy site. So essentially what we've got here is a situation where in November, we were pretty full in our profile, we had a reasonable rainfall event, and then there was no watering for a period of time. Right? And this is often what happens. We get this beautiful rainfall event, the, the, the farmer says, great, I've had 30, 40 millimetres, I, I don't have to water for a week. So they'll leave it for a week and then they'll start their irrigator up. Okay? What's happened to soil moisture? This here is your readily available water, there's 20 mils of available water, so that was 19 mils on that site when we measured it, 20 mils of available water. So fairly quickly we dropped below, didn't we? Because we weren't watering. Right? We then, these blue lines are his irrigation through that period of time and these grey ones are his rainfall during that period of time. What you'll notice is with these irrigations in here, and it wasn't until we got a rainfall, that we were irrigating, putting soil moisture in, but we weren't lifting the soil moisture back into that readily available zone, were we? So all this water was going in. What's the problem? There's two problems here. One is he didn't water here and then when he had this rain event, he stopped for a little bit. Right, back down to here again. Didn't lift it. We need to take this and we need to lift that up into there. Okay? Now in that particular season, the average of apotranspiration was only 4.3 over that period. Rain and irrigation was 198 mils. What was actually required if you calculate it was only 191. So if you look across that period, you say, actually, we've done a pretty good job. Right? We've put in 198, 91, 98 mils and only 191 was required. 
uh, was received. So what's the issue here? If you look at your growth rates, as we came into this section here, we were growing at 83 kilos of dry matter. Through the middle, we dropped down to 43 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day, and we're only just starting to lift it up towards the end. You can see the point, you can be irrigating, feeling really good about it, keeping everything green, but what happens to your production? Drops, okay, because you're below that readily available zone. So pretty simple stuff, but that was the stuff that caused the change in what that farmer did. Instead of making these mistakes, he kept on top of it, used less water, and grew heaps more grass. Now the reason he actually used less water is that in the second year he actually put variable rate irrigation on and turned his irrigation off his laneways and his um, irrigation channel. So he ended up using less water to achieve a better result um, through that period of time. To help to back up this whole process of understanding the green drought, we're doing some replicated trial work on our dairy research farm. So we have a, a research farm in Tassie, 300 cows that we milk on that research farm and we do a lot of research. We annoy the manager uh, immensely with all of our interruptions and so forth. So you probably know all about that from a research point of view. Uh, <laughs> um, so in this particular situation, what we're, we're trialling in some replicated um, rain out plots, so we're actually preventing rain from going on it so we can control exactly what's happening. We've got a couple of scenarios. One is a full irrigation where we're allowing it to go to a 12 and a half mil deficit and then refilling. Another one where we're allowing it to go to the 25 mil deficit and then refilling. One where we're allowing it to go to the 30 mil deficit and then just putting 12 and a half mils in, so keeping it down around that stress level. And then one which is a dry land plot which won't have irrigation until autumn. Running that over two seasons, so it's replicated four times um, on, our, on our site. Let's have a look at some of the data that's coming off that. So here's the example of our 12 mil deficit um, treatment, and this here is using Erie pasture. So here's our field capacity, here's our refill point, our irrigations and our rainfall. The actual trial component started here, so we're keeping it moist up till then mucking around with it, but we actually started our trial component. We're allowing it to dry down to 12 and a half millimetres and then filling it here. So this is basically what we're doing. So we're not allowing it to get down near the stress point at all. all right? What we're achieving, and let's just put this into context, about 8 o'clock this morning I got the um, uh, harvest data off this trial sent through to me because it's only just going now. It's, it's only wet weight and I've had to uh, estimate dry weight. So I've done a quick estimate of the yield per hectare from, from these plots. So it's about 80 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day grown on this scenario. Here's our soil moisture graph. So here is at 10 centimetres, our soil moisture signature, and 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80 centimetres. So what you'll notice, again, the trial started here in terms of our controlled component where we're putting in and out our soil moisture. So you'll certainly see where we're filling up. We're reaching saturation, uh, reaching just above field capacity, drying down, and then we've got our day-night use here. We're getting down to about here and then we're refilling it again. So we're allowing it to go down to about 12 and a half mil of deficit every time. We're seeing that that soil moisture is getting down to about 50 to 60 centimetres. So we can certainly see it affecting <coughs> that sort of depth on that particular site. If we go to our 25 mil deficit um, treatment, what we're doing is we're basically filling it up and allowing it to dry down to our refill point. Filling it up, allowing it to dry down, that's typical of a, um, a hard hose system putting on your 25 mils at a time, filling it up, drying it out, filling it up. The data that I picked up this morning on that means we're getting about 65 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day. So a little bit of a, a drop um, in that. So no, remember this is data that's just come through this morning, so it's very, very um, new and I haven't yet checked it properly because I haven't got all the data, but certainly we're seeing a, a reduction. If I look at uh, the soil moisture probes, there we have drying down, wetting up, drying down. So we're certainly, that 25 mils is filling it because it is getting to the point where it reaches and drops down quickly and then we have our day night here and then up and then down. And what you'll see is the soil moisture is actually going right through to 80 centimetres. What's the problem with that? It's going below the root zone, isn't it? So we're actually losing water there um, in this particular scenario versus a 12 and a half mil scenario. When we go to our 30 mil deficit, and then irrigating about 12, 12 and a half mils. So what we've done is we've dried it down to our stress point or to our refill point, and then we're kind of watering around that refill point um, based on the data coming from Erie Pasture, and we're getting about 50 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day. So we're getting lower and lower in terms of production. 
And this is only just the first cycle. Uh, so we've got another cycle to come, so it'll probably drop even lower. Um, and there's the soil moisture data. So here's wet during winter, and this is where we're at now. So we're kind of down there. And what you'll notice here is that when, now that we've got to this point, we're not actually refilling it. See, you have done get so some peaks up here. We're not actually filling it when we're putting that 12 and a half mils. And, and it's dropping over here slowly. We've got day-night use. But as we get down to about here, we're starting to see that the, the amount of water going out of the system is, is reducing. We're not drawing as much out. So we're certainly reaching our stress point. And this one here will probably be no, in, the, in the next day or so, it'll start to flatten out. We're not using it. So it gets to the stress point, then we put our 12 and a half mils in, gets to the stress point, we're putting it in. So that's certainly what's going on there. Um, and we're only getting about 50 kilos. Here's our dry land site. Obviously, it's dried right down. Day, night use, day, night use. I think there's a few little rain events in here that have just stopped it a little bit um, because we've simulated the 10% driest year. So we are putting rain in on a simulated basis for a dry year. Um, but essentially, we've flattened right out, so we're not using our water now on that particular site and we're getting 30 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day off that. So can you see the, the impact? 12 and a half mil irrigation, 25, at the stress level, which is, which is similar to a, a drought scenario, a green drought scenario, um, and then um, our dry land. Just a little bit of other work that we're doing. So we're doing, so one of our PhD projects there is looking at irrigation efficiency, irrigation effectiveness and soil function, so really focusing on the soil. So we've got a whole heap of um, infiltrometers in the, in the soil on a whole heap of different soils. We're doing some work on runoff, um, where we're putting a lot of runoff plumes under the irrigator and collecting um, information on that. Um, we're doing a lot of work on what's happening to the water in terms of infiltration into the root zone, in terms of irrigation effectiveness. Um, and with that work, what we're really starting to see is that there are massive differences in the different soil types um, right across the industry anywhere from very little runoff through to 50 to 60 percent runoff. So you might think that you're putting 15 mils on, when you actually go out there and look at it and, and measure it, you might be putting about half that on because the water that's actually getting into the root zone is about 50 percent of what you're actually putting on. So you say, oh, I'm putting 15 mils on to fill my bucket, you might only be putting about seven or eight mils. Uh, and that can really get you un unstuck. Um, particularly a problem in large pivots where as you go further and further out in the pivot, you're at your instantaneous application rate is getting greater and greater, so you can keep your depth the same. Big, big issues. So a lot of the big pivots in Tassie, um, you just, no, you're, you're getting 100 millimetres an hour application rate on the end of the pivot. Your soils can probably handle, no, at the best, 30 millimetres an hour on the really good soils. So what's going to happen with that water as it hits the ground? If you've got any slope in there at all, it's going to run. And a lot of that's not going to be effective, is it? Okay, and so we're measuring a lot of that. And then with this sort of stuff, we're showing that, you know, getting down to 10 centimetres, you might be only getting, you know, the effective wetted area of that with a lot of these um, applications. It might be only, you know, 30 or 40% of your irrigation is actually getting to that point. So you've really got to understand the limitations of your system and then understand what that means in terms of your irrigation. So we're doing a lot of work on that across a variety of soil types. We're also doing quite a bit of work on autonomous irrigation with the University of Southern Queensland where... We've got a whole heap of sensors out in the field that are collecting data, plus it's collecting weather data, and it's, it's developing variable rate maps automatically, and they're autonomously being put back into the system so that those systems can automatically irrigate every day. Or any time you put it on, there'll be an updated map as to what is the required uh, irrigation uh, for those sites. So there's quite a bit of work going on that. We're also doing work on spatial soil moisture measurements. So we have soil moisture probes that just measure at one point, and there's a real issue with placement of those probes to tell you what's going on. So we're actually doing some work with what we call L-band and P-band radiometer data to look at measuring soil moisture spatially. Um, and so there's a fair bit of work I've got next week. I'm spending a whole week in the field doing some work on that down at Yanko. Um, and so hopefully into the future we'll be able to look more at spatial measurement. At the moment we're only getting 5 to 10 centimetre depth of the measurement. We want to get down to 30 centimetres. So we're doing a lot of work on that as well. So there's, there's quite a lot of interesting stuff going on in the field at the moment.